Welcome to ReChurch. I'm Marshall Fant, the Director of Church Consulting and Strategic Planning for Gospel Fellowship Association Missions. My purpose is to encourage pastors and church leaders as you refocus, renew, and revitalize your churches. We've established this podcast to offer practical tips and suggestions as you equip disciples to make disciples. Welcome back to ReChurch. Marshall Fant here again. Glad to have you on our podcast, whether you're by Spotify or iTunes or Google Play or YouTube, whatever it is. And I'm uh, glad you're here. I got a, another great friend. It's a good thing of what I get to do, get to talk to a lot of friends. So Mike Hickson, Pastor Mike Hickson, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, introduce yourself to everybody, uh, sure. your wife, your children, your ministry, and all that type thing. Sure. Uh, so my name is Mike Hickson. I am an assistant pastor at Grace Church of Mentor in Mentor, Ohio. Uh, my oversight is discipleship and outreach. Uh, I am married. I My wife and I actually grew up in this church. So uh-huh. my parents and her parents were led to the Lord at Grace Church of Mentor. Uh, my wife's parents, she was six at the time, and my mom was like pregnant with me wow. at the time. We're second generation Christians, but our first, but our parents are first generation here in this church. Um, so I have three girls, a uh, 16-year-old, 14-year-old, and a 10-year-old who was absolutely delighted this past week when I described her as almost being 11. She said oh, she was man. to hear that deal. I was describing her as almost 11. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I've lived right. here in East Ohio for much of my life. So Mentor's actually just outside Cleveland? Right, so yeah, about, Cleveland. Yeah, about 20, 25 miles east, right up on the lake. Yep, yep. So, so it's it's a great place. And really, the way I got to know, um, really, Mike, really his dad first. And then I went up to see their disciple-making model. And if you haven't done that through Arch Ministries, I, I challenge you to go up to Grace Church and Mentor and just take a week and see what it's like and just observe. So after I went up there, uh, I don't, Mike, I don't know if I told you the story, but anyway, I called um, – I called Tim Potter. And I said, okay, Tim, I want the details of how this really happens in your church. Mm-hmm. Oh, it just happens. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> and so finally they said, oh, talk to Mike. Mike's the one. So I got a hold of Mike and that, <laughs> there you go. So there you go. again, it's good. So, all, right, all right. So Mike, here's yeah. the, here's the topic. You know, I love the book of Titus as a pastor and just mm-hmm. the way it lives out and the way it instructs us. And, you know, in, in Titus chapter two, it says this, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. All right, so I, I've, been, I've been in your church where you're part of the pastoral staff. I've, I've seen your family. And so the key phrase, in this present age, all right, so you are the next generation from me. So, again, uh, for our audience, when I, when I talk to Mike, I want to understand all right, so in the present age, how does he actively carry out the Great Commission um, as a dad, as a father of teenage girls, okay, in this culture, in this present age, as well as a pastor? So, again, the, if you don't know Grace Church of Mentor, um, and Mike, you interrupt, and I'm going to just set the table and let you take off. So, sure. Grace Church of Mentor, uh, Pastor Tim Potter followed his father right there in Cleveland. So, the church is about how old, Mike? Uh, it, was, it was a church plant back from 1948, so we're almost about 75 years old. Okay. Uh, they're, uh, Pastor Bob Potter, Pastor Tim Potter have pastored really for the past almost 50, 60 years. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. But it's expository preaching, conservative music, um, hymn books, uh, disciple making, Bible study, uh, orchestra. I mean, hell, it's still going to say, you can go online and, and watch what they're about. So it's, you know, looking at, at, um, very conservative theology, conservative worship style. Uh, mm-hmm. but yet I, I was very impressed with the, the community outreach. Okay. So mm-hmm. what I want to pick Mike's brain was, and again, this is coming from his perspective, the Hickson perspective and, and what that, so what, Ministering in this present age, as Titus 2 says, because then in Titus 3 8, which I think is a result of a healthy church, is then Titus 3 8 puts it like this it says that um, so that you may, those who believe God may, will be careful to engage in good deeds. And we know by Titus 3, the church is reaching the community. All right. So that's mm-hmm. kind of the, uh, a, a, fi- a long introduction, but that's kind of the yeah. reason I wanted Mike 
uh, to be with us. All right, so Mike, tell us a little bit. So as your personal philosophy of ministry is lived out. All right, okay, first as a husband, father, and then as a pastor, and then personally as a man in your community. So living in this present age. Now, how old are you? Uh, 44. 44. Okay, so your generation. Mm -hmm. Again, Mike Hickson, tell us what that looks like a little bit. So just run with it. Yeah, so I, I do think it is hope, uh, helpful for those who are listening to this to understand just a little bit of my progressive sanctification in this area because um, there was a time in, in the not too distant future where I really just didn't see my place having a role in, in the community. And uh, so I just, like I said before, I'm a second generation Christian. I was blessed to be brought up in a, in, in a family that really prioritized formal Christian education, right. uh, kindergarten through 12th grade, uh, was in Christian education. I spent four years going to Christian college. My, my degree in Christian college was biology and in particular biology education. So we, I say we, my wife and I, who's also from this area, we dated in college, came back to the area invested in our church because we loved Grace Church of Mentor, but we were not in ministry. Um, I mean, uh, like vocational, vocational ministry. ministry. Yeah. 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 So um, the two of us were both in education and we taught in uh, a Christian school here in the area. And and again, I am so, so thankful for uh, what I was provided in my upbringing. I'm thankful for the opportunities. And, and really to this day, you know, we still have people that, that touch base with us every once in a while that remind me of some of the stupid things I did as a, a science teacher and all that. But um, I, I in, in my life, the reason why I bring that up is because there was a time where I just kind of saw my ministry really being teaching and in the church, being involved in music, and I would help out with mission trips. I was a youth group sponsor. Yeah. And it came to outreach. I was just so uncomfortable. And for me, I took a lot of comfort in the formal outreaches that our church did. Like if we had a VBS or if we had a large like teen, you know, outreach in the community and, and uh, you know, those were things where I could certainly help out with. But yeah. And so in our world, we would call that like event-based evangelism, right? Yeah. yeah event-based. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so like that was fine. I could go on a missions trip, help out just fine, help out with the church, but actually cultivating a relationship with yeah. someone in my community Right. Um, making friends to me, that was, that just wasn't my thing. Um, I was great at teaching and, and, uh, I enjoyed the relationships. And if people came to church, they came to me, it was like, great. Yeah. I can, I can take it from here, but actually, you know, having relationships with my neighbors, having a relationship with people in the community to me, I, I felt like guys like Tim Potter, who's my senior pastor, who has that gift in spades. I mean, let the professionals hand it, handle it. I have my kind of niche. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's really important in light of what I'm going to say and share with you here in that this isn't like just my wheelhouse per se, but God has continued to open door after door after door and opportunities and really change me and my heart and my wife and my family's heart to reach our community. So right. um, I, I guess, you know, kind of moving forward from there, God has allowed me to cultivate a number of relationships. I, I, um, I, I do think it's important, you know, as you look at Titus chapter two, you know, it says that we are uh, living in this present age. I think it's important uh, to understand the distinction between being alive in this age and actually living in this age. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I, when I say being alive in this age, sometimes uh, we can look at just kind of existing in, in our culture. Like we just by our existence, we're in the world. Right. Uh, you know, John chapter 17, though, when you see Christ talking about uh, his disciples in their role, he wants them to be preserved from the wicked one, but he's also not praying that they would be taken out of the world. So God has called us as Christians to live in the world, to actually exist, and I would even say spiritually thrive in places where unbelievers aren't. And, you know, it's funny, when I was getting my degree, for biology education, I did do student teaching in a public school. Right. And I look back to those days, the the three or four months, and it was almost like spiritually, I was holding my breath. You know, like when you go underwater and you just kind of hold your breath and yeah. like, oh, yeah. can I last? I mean, that really was my approach versus, hey, these are souls that are going to be spending somewhere forever. Mm. And no, I'm not there to, to teach and preach the gospel, but 
you know, I look back and I think, man, what an opportunity that I completely missed out. Maybe they saw Christ in my actions. And again, it wasn't like I was going there to teach the gospel, but, but at the same time, it was more survival mode versus, wow, God may actually have put me here to have an impact, right. to build a relationship. And so, you know, in light of kind of where I am now, I, maybe that's just a helpful way of looking at it. It's like sure. actually living in the world versus kind of just survival mode. Um, I, and, and to me, what's been helpful in just being able to, okay, how, how is my, how am I, you know, in regards to my relationship, you know, with unbelievers and actually have friends. And, I, and I'd encourage if, if you're listening to this, maybe do this when you, when you get some time, you know, just go on your phone and, and see how many people you've texted in the last month and, and looking at the ratio of believers versus unbelievers and how many people that, that you could feel comfortable with just having a, a, a conversation by text. Not to say that that's like the measuring stick, right. but you know, just like, like how often are we having just friendly conversations and, and do we even know, you know, people well enough to be able to text them and say, Hey, how's it going? Or I, sure. you know, remember blah, 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 blah. You know, just something like that. Like just looking through my text and, and even to this day, um, you know, I, I feel convicted at how little I'm actually building friendships with people who need to hear Christ, right. you know? All right. That's good. So that's your background. And, and yeah. all right. So, all right. So again, so let's just, you know, all of us, you know, I think our lives, I like to describe it like a pie. Okay. You're a dad. Okay. You're yeah. a husband, you're a pastor, yeah. you got hobbies, you got all these yeah. things. And, and I know that you engage. So first, can we talk about your family? Is that all right? Sure. Because yeah. I know, um, again, I follow you. I know your family. So mm-hmm. you have a daughter that has a swimming career, right? <laughs> and I guess you could, I guess you could put it that way. Yeah. So my oldest daughter, Julia, yeah. uh, she was born with a, a pretty significant disability. She is uh, what we call a congenital amputee. And um, so missing most of her right leg. I bring that up because she is able to swim and, you know, if you're disabled and you're able to do something athletic, you're kind yeah. of put in the compartment of inspirational. Yeah. So uh, we, you know, at a young age, she liked to do some sports and liked to run. And so God has, for whatever reason, opened a door through that disability and through swimming to bring us into contact with a lot of people. Um, we've been able to build a relationship with a lot of people that frankly, we just see often. So, you know, we have swim meets, we go, we see the same parents and we build friendships. So that's, that's been an open door. Um, it's not just athletics. I think right. again, the nature of disability sometimes allows for you to be able to speak into lives there you go. differently than other, other ways. Right. But, but that, that's where God has, that's how he made her. And yeah. that's yeah. how so she, she was born that way. Yeah. yeah. And mm-hmm. she embraces this, right? She does. Um, I, I mean, I'd be lying if I said that it was all smooth sailing, but, oh, yeah. but I know, I know. You know. She had a conversation with my wife not too long ago and uh, Kelly was able to ask her, it's like, if you could change that about you, you know, would you, and you know, just praise God for this response. You know, she said, actually, no, because if I was normal, like everybody else, I'd probably be more, you know, arrogant, or I might be more, there might be other ways where, where I would be yeah. just really too proud. Now, don't get me wrong. My, my daughter is the farthest thing from a, a super saint, but I was just really impressed to hear how yeah. her understanding of God having her made that way um, has allowed for her to be able to speak into other people's lives and to, to, to point people to Christ. So, you know, but, but it has to start with you, know, you. It has to start with the family philosophy of ministry. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Like, like yeah. this is, this is, you know, something that, that, yeah, it, it starts at home and you're fearfully wonderful, wonderfully made. You know, we have two other daughters too. So, you know, they, they have, you know, just how, you know, they're made and, you know, the relationships that they've been able to cultivate in, in sure. the different activities that we have. But, um, you know, my kids get tired of hearing me say, you know, that person is a soul and they're going to spend somewhere forever. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that, you know, when there is that interaction, that there's sure. a soul awareness of, of those who are around us. It's not about just us getting to heaven. Um, you know, I had I, one author that, that put it this way. He says, if you have a theory about salvation that does not include discipleship, you may just decide to take a ride to heaven and not worry about anything or anybody else. Mm. Um, you know, that's, that, it's an easy way of thinking, to be honest with you, where when it's just you, your spouse, your kids, Hey, we're good. Yeah. And people come to church and hear about Jesus. 
you know, from our family standpoint, really, we, we've tried to impress upon each one of us uh, that God has us each as disciple makers. And um, that's going to look different at different seasons of life and they're young. But um, but at the same time, that, that, that is a reality of who we are as, as Christians. All right. So let's back up to I immediately jumped in with your kids. Let's back up to you and Kelly. OK, sure. so first, as a couple, uh, mm-hmm. if somebody's saying, wow, I need this, what are some ways you and Kelly have found just to be able to interact with other couples or maybe just Kelly with women, you with men? What are some ways you have found your life, God allowing your life to intersect uh, with unbelievers in a way that you're living sensibly, wisely and all this, but in the present age with unbelievers as a part of your life? Sure. Uh, so. You know, for a while I was working and my wife was home. And when our kids finally were all in school, you know, my wife, my wife was able to work a little bit more. And uh, I had a couple different positions in different places, but now she's actually a secretary for one of the principals in our local school district. So she interacts, and I'm not exaggerating, she interacts with dozens and dozens and dozens of families on a daily basis where she's calling, she's setting up point, appointments, you know, students with IEPs you know, just educational plans and whatnot. So, you know, when we go into our community, my wife knows kids everywhere. She knows parents everywhere. Um, And a lot of that just has to do with her role at the school. Um, You know, every community is different, um, but I would say where we are, um, our community is our school system. And um, to be Praying for our community is to simultaneously pray for the people in the community. And we found that, that those relationships built uh, sometimes through sports, sometimes through, you know, my wife's position at the, there at the school and whatnot. Um, we've been able to get to know a lot of, of different people. I think the other way uh, is frankly, slowing down and taking time to get to know people in our neighborhood, um, our neighbors, a couple doors down, like, yeah. You don't get as much done in the lawn, um, but we have some really good conversations. You know, my wife and I, we like to take walks, walking through with our dog. You see some of the same people over and over and over again sure. and you stop and you talk. I, I, that doesn't sound like rocket science, but there is, you know, big fan of God's sovereignty here. He has you living where you're living. Sure. You know, it's a matter of being a good neighbor um, and and getting to know the people and striking up conversations and building friendships, those are type of things that that um, that that I, we've really seen the Lord work with. Do you All mind right. if I share just like a oh, real yeah, quick? Go, yeah, go, love, yeah, yeah, do it. All right. So this actually happened with one of our, our church outreaches, um, to where we have an outreach in our community. It's like a fast, you know, kind of like a civic thing where people set up booths and whatnot. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I'm there as representative of Grace Church, and there's a guy who walks in front of our booth, and he's wearing a prosthetic limb. All right, wait now, a minute. This is wait a minute. This is a community fest, a community day. Not yeah, yeah, not uh, we call it Mentor City Fest. Yeah, but so not at, we're in the city, Mentor. Yeah. Not at the church, but in the city. In the city, that's and right. You're so, setting up a Grace Church booth, right? Okay, that's I just want okay, to make sure I was yeah, I'm sorry, I should be no, better. No, I'm just trying to track. Go, go yeah. ahead. So, so at any rate, there's a guy that walks by, he's wearing a prosthetic leg. Now, obviously I have a vested interest in that, Sure. you know, white or my, my daughter, she's an amputee, she wears prosthesis. And so I'm like, you know, I'm here to represent grace, but I'd really like to hear this guy's story. Yeah. And so I caught up with him and we started talking and I got to know his name. Uh, we ended up talking for about 45 minutes and it actually wasn't about spiritual things at all had everything to do with just kind of his story and who his prosthetist was and, you know, where he gets his medical treatment and this, that, and the other. So we exchanged numbers. Um, I want to fast forward here just because he has become a dear friend of our family. Mm. Um, I, I, as I learned more about him medically, you know, we, you know, we got, we went to Starbucks and, you know, I learned that he's a Jewish cantor. He's a cantor at, at synagogue. And so, um, you know, I'm a pastor. He works at a synagogue. So we were talking about just differences with, with services and whatnot. And um, I, I started, obviously I care, you know, about souls. So, you know, thinking, okay, Lord, you're opening this door. Um, so started talking more about spiritual things and we just both hit it off. Um, so we invited him over to our house for Thanksgiving and he's kind of like a regular attendee at our, at our house for Thanksgiving. I mean, he's my, yeah. my family now knows him. 
Yeah. He actually become good friends with my older brother, uh, my older brother, Eric, who works for the Cleveland Clinic. He came to my brother's son's grad party. Mm. Uh, and so doing stuff like that, now he's actually meeting other believers because, you know, I'm blessed to have a family that has saved people and, sure. and things start coming up. But, but Marsh, I, I, I do want to share this with you as well, because there's a reason why I described him the way I did up to this point. Because as I got to know him, come to find out, he is probably politically, morally on the opposite end of, of where I would be. Right. Uh, very pro LGBT, very pro choice, very pro uh, progressive, um, just worldview. I mean, we are like opposites. However, he was a dear friend sure. and is a dear friend. And I guess had I known all of those things, maybe from the outset, there might have been more reticence to like, oh, I don't know if we're really going to have much in common. But what God did was brought points of commonality and a friendship that actually allowed for those things that I just shared with you to come out. And we've talked about them. Um, interestingly enough, so he's in he's he, his background. He's he's Jewish, but he's more agnostic. Right. And said that while he was in school, he was in high school. There is a, a, an evangelistic outreach that took place in his in his town to where um, it was a bunch of Christians who were really passionate about evangelizing Jews. And so they had this big crusade and a lot of Christians came into his school, his high school, and it was kind of like try to win a Jew for Christ. There's only like 20 Jews in the school. And so he's like, yeah, for basically three months, I had this target on my back by all the Christians who were trying to win me to Jesus. Mm. And. And I'm like, oh my word, you know, what was that like? And just kind of talking through and he wasn't angry or upset about it, but it was, he was very aware of my ultimate goal. If you want to put it that way, right. yeah, wanting to see him come to Christ. And the cool thing is, is that while that is my ultimate goal, I love being his friend yeah. and he loves being my friend and he's been in my house. And if you were to say, Hey, do you know that a person who's progressive, who actually, you know, is very liberal in regards to all of these political views and LGBT, he's going to be in your house and he might talk about those things around your kids. Right. You'd want to be as far away from that as possible. And, 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 and maybe, I don't know, maybe that, that could be a response, but, but from the other standpoint, this is a guy that needs to know Christ yeah. and he didn't come in the door having all of those labels. He came in as a guy who I got to know he's an amputee. So he and my daughter hit it off. Sure. And, and it's just a really awesome way. He hasn't accepted Christ. I wish I could, you know, end the story with yes, and he trusted Christ. And but, um, but, but no, no but, I mean, but we yeah. know a qualification from an elder is he's to show hospitality. Yeah. So that's what you're doing. So the question Trying. is, yeah. yeah, do we have the question? I always ask myself: Do we have unbelievers we can even show what hospitality looks like? That's Again, fellowship. Fellowship is great. Okay. But that's a byproduct of everything else. So, no, I love the story because, again, yeah. you're, it's, it's intentional. God opened the door. There's, an, there's a divine intersection of your life and his. And, and also because, you know, you had a common, you know, a common theme there with the prosthetic. So yeah. that's great. And, and not just – it wasn't just me doing it. Like, okay, right. I'm yeah. Mr. Mike. But this was my entire family. So right. my wife yeah. knows him. My kids know him. Now my extended family knows him. Now it's like – Thanksgiving, he wasn't able to come this year because of COVID. And it's just, oh man, where's Lance? You know, yeah. everybody misses him. And so it's really this relational approach, Amen. seeing someone as a soul that's going to spend somewhere forever. And then that person actually becomes part of your life. And that's a really good thing. So we pray for him. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. Yeah. I All right. Can go so on. wouldn't you say, but I would, I want to pick up on that. So wouldn't you say that, especially, like a Christmas Eve dinner or Christmas dinner and Thanksgiving dinner, maybe a 4th of July picnic or Memorial yes. Day picnic. These are great opportunities. They're accepted in our, in our culture, in our age, where you can reach out and make them a part of what you're doing, right? Absolutely. Okay. I, abs and, and you can even do it on your terms if yeah. you want to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Like they come to your place. They come to enjoy something like a birthday. I'm glad you brought that up because my neighbors who we become friends with, it's just kind of like a, a an open kind of policy. They're in, they're an older couple. And yeah. so my kids have a birthday. Hey, Jeff Esther, come on, please come over and, and have some cake with us. Yeah. And so do, and, and not only, I, I mean, do they get the gospel every time they come over? No, no. but they know they're loved sure. and they know they care about them. 
And then, so when it comes down to just maybe the two of us, or maybe the four of us, two of us couples sitting on their front porch on a different day and conversations come up about how society is going, it's an open door because we've built relational equity. I kind of like that terminology. You build relational equity to serve as the springboard for sharing and talking about spiritual things. Okay. And so this is within the the present time, the present time uh, of season of your life, you and Kelly. All right. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to switch gears a minute. So I want to switch now to the church side. Okay. Because again, I've been in your church, your church is reaching multiple generations. Okay. Which Mm -hmm. all generations, is that fair to say, wouldn't you say that Mike, that they're all generations represented. Yes. Um, and, and so it's not just, uh, the old and it's not just the young, but there's, you know, all four generations are, are representing your church. All right. So as a pastor, uh, as there at Grace Church, a mentor, what, what do you see as some ways that you have found not we're pragmatists, but what are some effective ways as a church? Okay. So you, you told us how you're doing it. You're making disciples, you're living wisely, you got your family involved in this present mm-hmm. time. What about the church? How, how, how would you advise a pastor to engage in this present age, his church with the community? Yeah, so to start off with, leading by example. I mean, okay. uh, <laughs> we're, we're called to do the work of the yeah, evangelist. And go. so I, we can't expect our congregation to do it if we aren't. I, I, to me, I think that's, that's more intuitive, but I also think it's biblical. Um, that, that, and, and so how does their church know? Well, by praying, um, by, by, you know, obviously varying levels of sensitivity, but your church people should know that you are praying for, and that you're maybe in smaller groups asking prayer for the person Amen. or persons in the community that you've connected with. And that should just be a regular pattern. Um, again, I go back to who you're texting and, and the level of activity that you have with people in the community, really why I, 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 again, it it comes down to if, if you aren't doing this, I don't know that you should really expect your people to to be on on board with it as well. I'm going to get you to repeat that again. So you are on pastoral staff. Yes. A great church mentor. So Mm -hmm. would you just repeat what you said? Cause I really want to, I want to emphasize that, that if you as a pastor are not doing it, how would you expect your people to do it? Is that absolutely? Yeah. Okay. I agree. yeah. Yeah. And, and here's, and, and that's why, that's part of the reason why I shared my testimony at the very right. beginning, yeah. because I wasn't doing this. All right. So but, let me ask you, so how does it, how does the congregation prayer request? Okay. Mm-hmm. So the congregation, but they, I mean, I know your pastoral staff, I know Tim, I know mm-hmm. Steve, I know you. Yep. And, and, and so all of you more or less publicly, anybody can walk up to you at any time, right. And say, who is the unsafe person in your life? Don't, and there's, the, I'm not saying that's the quote y'all use. Right. But there is that type of transparency and culture of you living out the Great Commission personally and as a church staff. Is that absolutely, yeah. absolutely? Like, like I, I would say it goes beyond just pastoral staff. By God's grace, uh, I would say it extends to all of our elders and most of our deacons as well. That there is a transparency about um, leadership to where our primary role on this planet is to make disciples uh, and. Part of that is evangelism. And right. so I, it, it, our people are accustomed to hearing us praying for the unbelievers that God has uh, placed in our life. And again, that's part of how the Holy Spirit worked in my life. I wasn't a pastor when I first came to Grace. I was right. a science teacher. Right. But I have my leadership praying for unbelievers and asking us to be praying for unbelievers that God might put in our life. And you know what? He actually does because... Part of that prayer is not just God providing the opportunity, but God actually changing us in the way that we think. Like when we pray for that, God opens our eyes to see what's actually there. So I'm praying for Lance, my friend, who's the amputee. But in the meantime, God's also bringing other people. And he does that with the congregation as well. I have to lead the way, though, as a pastor. All right. So, um, again, I'm not trying to make a pastor feel uncomfortable or a deacon mm-hmm. feel uncomfortable, but wouldn't mm-hmm. it be, would it be fair to say, Mike, that a deacon could walk up to you or you could walk up to any deacon and say, Hey, tell me the unsafe person in your life right now. How can I pray for that unsafe person? Who is that? I mean, y'all do this right. And there's, but there's no, 
uh, it's not offensive. It's considered, a, you know, right? I mean, this is just part no. of living in this present age, right? That That's correct. And, and, and also, I, I guess from a context standpoint, this doesn't happen overnight and it didn't happen overnight. And I think it's also uh, in part, um, you know, a lot of times the church looks an awful lot and has the skill set and the strengths of its senior pastor. And so we have a senior pastor who very much pounds the table for evangelism and has a strong skill set in evangelism. And so, you know, there are, we, we've, we've seen that play out. And, and when you see a soul come to Christ, you know, there's a natural enthusiasm that, that, that comes with that. One of the, I mean, just, I don't, I don't know, you know, Marsha, that we have necessarily people coming and, and saying, Hey, who is it that you're witnessing for? One of the things that we do do in, uh, you know, be it uh, maybe a Wednesday night group meeting or, you know, sometimes even like a, a deacons meeting or uh, a missions committee meeting right. is we have this phrase, what's the good news about the good news? And, you know, who is it that you've been able to share the gospel with? Or who is it that maybe you've witnessed to in the past that, that we can be in prayer for? And so there's this ongoing kind of a reminder, reemphasis, reinforcement of what it is that we're here on the planet to do. We're here to bring glory to God by evangelizing the lost and then equipping the saints uh, with the goal of Christ's likeness. So, so that's, it's, it's not a, Hey, we're twisting your arm. What's your problem? It's let's go in this way and, and let's grow together because frankly, I blow it. You know, there's witnessing opportunities that I've had that I completely blow. And a lot of times that actually is really encouraging for the congregation as well. Um, you know, the, we just <laughs> have Lent, you know, and so yeah. all there's a lot of Roman Catholics in our area and they're all complaining about the stuff they can't eat for Lent. Yeah. And, um, you know, there I am I have one situation where they're sitting there talking about this and it's like a conversation just tailor made for the gospel. And I'm just like, I don't even know what to say mm. until I do it. And yeah. I'm the pastor of outreach for crying out loud. I love discipleship. I love evangelism, but totally blew it. Yeah. And in that time, it's like, God. I pray for my people that if they have a similar opportunity, that, that they would be able to have the words and the courage maybe to say what, what I didn't. And, you know, by God's grace, he, he seems to be answering that. So, All right. So I want to wrap, wrap it up with that. this, wrap it up with yeah. this. And, and it may take a few minutes to explain. All right. So um, big picture. All right. Yeah. So you and Steve Sindelar are both on staff, mm-hmm. pastoral staff, and both of you really came up through the church, correct? Yes. All right. So, uh, what I observe is there was the why. This is why we do. We make disciples because we're commanded to. I mean, we can't. Right. I mean, we, this will be, but I think what I have noticed uh, with your group is it's not only the why, but the how-tos are clearly explained. Mm-hmm. All right, so uh, number one, a lot of pastoral shortages we have are because pastors are not duplicating themselves in Christ within mm-hmm. the church. All right, so. Would you just take the closing comments and say, okay, um, if a church, let's just say a pastor has never had the how-tos of living out the gospel in this present age, uh, outside coming to an arch conference or coming to Grace Church and mentor, would you just take a few minutes and lay out, all right, y'all have material you use. Mm -hmm. Prayer is a key part of your church. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, and maybe how you equip the people to duplicate their lives in Christ. I mean, is that too big a topic to wrap up or is that another whole podcast? <laughs> <laughs> it might be. I don't know. Um, I, I would say, you know, we'll be the first ones to tell you that we do not have the corner on the market when it comes to evangelism, discipleship, sure. when it comes to, you know, church planting. We, we have so much to learn. We've made so many mistakes, but God has been really, really gracious. Um, I, I think it starts off first and foremost with love. Both Pastor Steve and I, we did grow up in the church, and by God's grace, our church has gotten to know us and and seen the qualifications of ministry to where they would elect for us to be in the pastorate or a, a pastors at their church. But we were loved, and we knew we were loved. Um, that is such a big deal. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up, and so you have that that kind of uh, the love from the congregation. And and in particular, we had a love from our pastoral leadership who invested time. So I really think that's the second part of it. It's love yeah. and time. I know that sounds really, really basic, but there is no substitute for both of those things. 
that I knew that even though I made mistakes, that I was being loved, um, that, that I was being cared for, right. um, spiritually, that my, my identity was not tied up in all the things I was doing around the church. Okay. But all the ministries that I was serving in. And man, I served in a ton, like Saturday work parties, mission, you know, all of that stuff. That was not my identity. My identity to my pastors, that is. My identity was, hey, this person is a disciple maker. They're a brother and sister in Christ. Yeah. And we're going to love them. We're going to shepherd them through that person. Okay. There's varying levels of ability. Um, but but we saw that from our pastors. And we also saw that from other godly men and women in the church. And that's part of the equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry. So so to that point, and, and Marsha, I don't know if this this touches exactly on, on where you're going with it, but but we were endeared to our church. And if those who you're shepherding aren't endeared to your church, it might not be that they have a heart problem. Mm -hmm. It may be that, that, and I want to put this graciously and, and, and I say this with love, but it may be that, they, they, they don't feel that love. Maybe and I'm going to quote, you know, trellis on the vine here. It's like, what spiritual problem do I need in order for my pastor to give me attention uh, yeah, mm -hmm. to, to follow up with me versus, Hey, I care about you. How are right. things going? And we spend some time together. Um, and, and that has allowed for a real endearment. I'd say with Steve and I to our church that we had that now we're, by God's grace, trying to reproduce it in others as well. Have you seen with other pastors that we get in a rut of only paying attention to those who come with problems, marriage problems, addictions, or whatever, and therefore we, I mean, you know, and again, have, have you seen a pattern of men to getting worn out with those with problems and not have the energy to to deal with the others? And I think, would, would you say that's because we've not equipped others to do the work of the ministry? Would that be a fair I, way I think to so, and, and I'm guilty of it. I mean, as you describe it, I, I think yeah, yeah, yeah. There, are, there are souls that I know that have been here faithfully that just really need a spiritual shot in the arm, as it were, you know, encouragement. And I can too often be preoccupied by the high needs ministry. I, I do think it's a combination of trust. Like, do we actually trust the people that we are equipping yeah. to, do the, to do the work of the ministry? And then I think it's also, I, I think it's, it's sometimes a lot more noble. This is our job. You know, yeah. the people that come, it's, it's a volunteer society and, and by God's grace, they're growing. And how much do you want to really weigh you know, them down as it were? But often what you find is those priest believers, those people yeah. indwelt by the Holy Spirit who are studying God's word, they may have the spiritual equipment to do it actually better than you. Uh, and they can invest that time and energy and love. So I, I think it's kind of a both and. All right. Uh, last word. Last word. You want to say anything when you want to say that you want to wrap up here? Yeah. By God's grace, I'm just so thankful for God's patience just with me. Um, because again, I, I, I feel <laughs> like, like the, the first 30 years of my Christian life were so apathetic when it came to the gospel in the community. And now sure. it's not yeah. like, you know, I'm trying to, to, to do penance and, and make up for lost time. But, but God can change, and it's just one person at a time. I mean, you know, there, the, this perception that I have to go out and win all of men are for Christ. Man, if Lance comes to Christ, yeah. and he uses me, and then Lance becomes a disciple maker himself, and then he reaches, I mean, I, I think that's where it's at I at the end of the day. I mean, I there's value in what we do as church and what we do corporately with events, yeah. but man, there is no substitute for disciples making disciples. And when we see our church people actually doing that and owning that, uh, that'll get you up out of bed in the morning, but big time. Amen. And I, my, again, my definition of a healthy church is where you see equipped disciples yeah. continually making disciples all to the glory of God. That's Amen. Right. All right, That's Mike right. Hickson, uh, is it okay if we put your email address in the show notes? Is that good? Sure. So people yeah, can reach yeah, that's, out to that's fine. All right. Hey, brother, thank you. Appreciate oh, it very Thank much. You. Again, Mike Hickson, he and his wife, Kelly. They have three great daughters there, live in Mentor, Ohio. And again, they minister at Grace Church of Mentor. Hey, brother, thank you very much. God bless. Oh, hey, thank yep. you so much. Thank you. Appreciate yep. it. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. You're listening to ReChurch, a podcast of Gospel Fellowship Association Missions. If you would like more information about our ministry or how we may assist you and your church, visit us at gfamissions.org slash consulting.